This morning we continue working through the Gospel of Matthew. And from the 15th chapter of Matthew, after Jesus has healed the, some sick, we pick up a story in the 15th chapter. Then Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands before they eat. Jesus then called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to Jesus, Do you know the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? Jesus answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to Jesus, Explain this parable to us. Then Jesus said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. A little dust from um, Friday and Saturday being here, because I didn't bother the dust bunnies at my house. The Pharisees had lots of rules. Now, I used to think my mom and dad had a rule. Lots of them. And they did. But the Pharisees had even more than my mom and dad, which I, until I got to seminary, didn't even believe that was possible. But Jesus says, listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it's what comes out of the mouth that defiles when our middle son Payne was young, uh, I guess he started a pre-kindergarten program for autistic children when he was two and a half. You think it's scary putting a kindergartner on the school bus. You ought to try putting a two and a half year old on the school bus. Jim followed the bus all the way to the school. <laughs> but every day when the teacher met the bus, she had this big red buggy that had places for six children to sit. You may have seen some of those. Um, and this particular morning, she loaded up the buggy and was headed down the hallway to her classroom. And the principal walked toward them. And as was the principal's custom, she called each of those children by name, looking straight at them, and said, good morning, so and so, and waited for the student to react in some way, because one of the things with autistic folks is their, their particular children, their difficulty having give and take with, with words. And so when she got around to my son Payne, she said, good morning Payne. He heard his name and he looked at her. And she waited for a while to see if he was going to say anything. Well, very loudly he said a word that began, began with an S and C ended with a T. Oh. And the teacher said, well, that's good talking pain, but we don't use that word. Oh. Needless to say, I got a phone call that afternoon. The teacher knew that both Jim and I were preachers, and so she was laughing, a big belly laugh. I could just see her on the other end of the phone with tears coming down her cheeks. She was laughing so hard that I didn't really understand the story until she got to the S word. And then I was so embarrassed. You embarrassed? I was embarrassed. <laughs> I was the color of this. And if the floor of the parsonage could open up, I would have gladly have dropped through it. I was so embarrassed. You talk about a wake-up call about your language. No matter how clean you are on the outside, 
It doesn't help if your insides are filthy. Jesus wasn't knocking washing hands. Jesus was concerned about the Pharisees' hearts. The Pharisees had become spiritual nitpickers, dealing with little bitty minor issues while ignoring the critical major issues of the day. Reverend Donald Gray Barnhouse was a British pastor at the beginning of the 20th century, and he was invited to a Bible conference in Pennsylvania. And two older women chaperones came up to him and were complaining because some of the girls were not wearing stockings. These women wanted Dr. Barnhouse to rebuke the young women. Well, Dr. Barnhouse told the chaperones, well, the Virgin Mary never wore stockings. <gasps> what? Yes, in Mary's time, stockings were unknown. And as far as we know, they were first worn by prostitutes in Italy in the, four, excuse me, in the 15th century. And then later, a lady of, noble, uh, of nobility scandalized society by wearing stockings at a court ball. Before long, everyone in the upper classes was wearing stockings. By Queen Victoria's time, Stockings had become the badge of the Victorian prude. Just like you all, those women in the silence. It's amazing how we become hung up on relatively minor issues. In one of my congregations, purple hair became the spiritual equivalent of murder. I hear people talk. And tattoos, oh my goodness. We won't even talk about that. Legalism strained at a gnat while swallowing a camel. Now lest you think that Jesus had something against, really against the Pharisees. He approved of many of the things that they did, but not their priorities. Because don't forget, Jesus was a practicing Jew. Every Sabbath, he was in the synagogue. We know that because the scripture says, as was his custom. Even if he disagreed with the preacher, Jesus was there. Even if Jesus knew his fellow worshipers were hypocrites, Jesus was there. Even though there was nothing more Jesus could learn about God, Jesus was there. He was part of the family of believers. For Jesus said, I have come to fulfill the law, not to destroy it. Jesus liked some of the things that the Pharisees were doing. But Jesus never countenanced people who patted themselves on the back for keeping the intricacies of the law while ignoring hurting people all around them. The Pharisees were building walls that shut people out of God's love. While they were observing all the niceties of their faith, they made their neighbors feel like dirt. Rather than being a unifying force in society, the Pharisees were divisive. Rather than being inclusive, the Pharisees were exclusive. Rather than lifting up people, they made other people feel unworthy and unclean. What the Pharisees did not see was that God wants bridges rather than walls. The Jewish people owed a debt, a great debt, to the Pharisees. For much of what is best in Judaism would have been lost without them. Their insistence on keeping the traditions helped the Jews maintain their identity when they were overwhelmed with the idolatry of the nations all around them. And the 
Pharisees did this by setting themselves apart. Now lest we think that's strange, parents confront this conundrum. They want to protect their children. Parents understand that the kind of people that a youth runs around with helps determine their behavior. So on the one hand, they know that God does not want, we know that God does not want us to wall ourselves off from others. But on the other hand, as parents, I was on this too, I, I wanted my teenagers to run around with the good ones. It would help to keep them out of trouble. It would be a positive influence. And it's a delicate balancing act, which you do. And it's a balancing act that Pastor Mike and I try to model It does no good to have a virtuous life, one that does all the right things, if that just makes you a Pharisee. Clean hands, but dirty heart. Christians may wear white on Sunday, but that's the only day. All the other days we better have on our working clothes, because we've been blessed with a mission in every other room than this one in this building. Because you can't see out of the stained glass. But in every other room in this building, you can look out the windows and you can see our mission field. More and more houses in our neighborhood are becoming rentals, which means that the people are more transient. They don't put down roots as easily because they don't have a house that they have to buy and sell and all that sort of thing. Transient, more transient. Transportation, or rather the lack of public transportation, limits job opportunities for people who live in our neighborhood. We don't even have a grocery store within a mile of Highland Church. Next time you buy your groceries, try carrying the last mile to your house. One of the things that was almost a deal breaker in me coming here three years ago was the us and them language that I was hearing. A sanctuary for folks versus them compass. We have worked in this church for years, and they are new, and they don't know how to do it. Well, hallelujah, hallelujah, I have not heard that much in the last couple of months. Can I hear an amen somebody? Amen. It's very good that we've gotten over that. But I do hear us then language about the Wednesday night suppers. On Wednesday nights, we have 40 to 80 potential members eating here every single week. And you're not here to meet them. You're not here to greet them. You're not here to get to know them. Or to invite them to come and sit with you on Sunday morning. After we eat, we have 30 people active in our prayer and healing service on Wednesday night. Don't you need to pray? Isn't there some hurt in your life that you'd like God to heal you? Where are you? We're getting ready to launch a new worship service on Monday nights at Dante's Pizza. And it's being called to the Inferno. Don't understand why? Go to the library and look up Dante's Inferno. Hopefully, you get an easy to read English version. Why are we doing that? Because there are people in this city who don't go to church, who have never been to church, 
who don't understand what churches are. They have a skewed view of what church and church membership is because all they see is in the media. And most of the time when the church is talked about in the media or on television or, or movie or something, it makes me want to go throw up because it has nothing to do with the church. You know that. We're reaching out to these folks. So will you come and worship? or salad or something and get to know people who need to be introduced to Jesus. In the past week, I've been working with two different families who don't have a church. Somebody in the family dies. They don't have anybody to bear. What are they going to do? directors now have to call the Methodist Church because the Methodist Church will help. That's what we can do. You see, you can be a Pharisee. You can sit right here with your hands very nicely folded and keep a superior attitude. But know this. That is not what Jesus is interested in. Jesus mouthpiece in the mission field all around him. 